um, if Max turns around and takes Vault Alert and adds, you know, revocation services for a fee or different things like that, I mean, that's contributing to the underlying protocol. You know, some of us and all of us actually who've been part of the community, I mean, we need to get the underlying protocol rent free, interoperable, scalable, secure you know, self-sovereign IDs, the namespace, and all of that in place. And then actually, like all of us could build our own opportunities on top of that, you know, in a way that like really creates value and turns value to the people creating it. But I think it's just key that the underlying protocol that we're all, like I actually intend over time be building stuff on top i don't know when i'm gonna stop building the not stop i never you know don't intend to stop but I, mean, I don't know when it's going to be the right time to say okay we've got the underlying rent free scalable you know bus protocol in place and there's really a need to build services above and, you know not all services above should be free because we're people in a world economy so you know, if people are creating certain kind, I mean, the source and the underlying protocols and all of this, I think that should be free and absolutely. But when people start, you know, building like vertical value that they've got to get some return on or it just won't happen, I think that's reasonable too. And, and I think people can create opportunities for themselves, whether, you know, all of us, if we work on an opportunity that is, whether, you know, some people are, are doing trading or some people are doing, you know, the, the opportunities being real businesses that are built using, you know, various PBAS currencies. I mean, there are really so many opportunities that are going to be possible, you know, that doing those people in the community will be the earliest ones with those opportunities and the understanding to leverage that doing those will not only help but really be necessary over time for the growth of the entire platform and network so i'm i'd be happy to see any number of people in the community you know pursue opportunities with what we're building and be able to become self-sovereign not necessarily you know if they're feeling like they have to actually work for someone or an organization dictating what they need to do but feel they should be doing different things i think everybody should have the opportunity to do what they contribute in ways that they really believe will make the most difference anyways i, I actually joined listen so uh, and, and maybe give an update at some point but i don't think i should be first i think i should uh, say stuff later so i can have a chance to just listen to the meeting too it happens um I uh, wanted to um, point out what Creative Ninja uh, posted. It has an excellent overview in my, uh, uh, my modest opinion about uh, what Virus is and can do and uh, how we differ from other platforms that, that have DeFi protocols. And uh, with that article as a basis, it would uh, enable you to uh explain to to people that are not aware of virus that are uh, fully immersed in other projects or are total newbies to point at what we why we are different and what we do different and i think it's uh, it's a great article uh, i do have some reservations about specific uh things but nothing major basically so uh, um I can encourage you to, to read that and to uh, use that if you try to onboard people because uh, we try to get people in, of course, and uh, create that interest into Verus and why they should use it. So uh, that sounds like a great opportunity. Um, Max's uh, recap of the month January is out. Of course, we have all seen uh, the Vault Alert uh, uh, website that uh, Mike just mentioned easy to check if your vault is uh, still locked on your ID so I think that's our things that 
uh, set us apart from any other blockchain and uh, the common utility of testnet of course will make all the difference um and i really like the uh, discussions uh, that i've seen in uh, in discord right now uh, about the bridging and the vulnerabilities uh, etc and mike maybe you could explain to us at some point uh, in the meeting uh, uh, why the virus bridge is different from all the other bridges out there that would be great yeah you uh, know actually i'm happy to, if you want to do that now do yeah, that. yeah i'd be happy to do that and also i appreciate that you pointed out those articles um, is there a tweet to share around that bitcoin insider made of ninja article um because i don't i'm not sure that i saw one on that uh I shared the one I from the monthly recap. But. I haven't seen that. Uh, if there's a tweet about it, uh, I'll uh, put it up online uh, ASAP. Okay. And then, um, yeah, actually, the bridge, that's a really, because when that all started to happen, um, I know Allbits wrote some things about that, and we had a discussion, and that was great. I've been focused, like, we actually have a release that we're working to get out right now. And I, I don't, I didn't actually talk to people working on it this morning, so I don't know um, exactly where it is. But I do know that, like, we don't, I haven't seen any reported issues on, you know, the PBAS that we talked about and the bridging that includes that. And I'll, I'll definitely talk about this in a second. And that um, Chris started uh, jumping in just to get the new hardened Ethereum. Um, uh contracts running and that actually so like yesterday i fixed an issue that um would you know it brings up the newer hardened or more hardened eth bridge um on one side and i don't know really where that is on the other side today but so basically we've got a release that's on its way that's going to do a major upgrade to testnet that is all working on the PBAS side. And the only real question is, are we gonna have the older or newer, more hardened ETH bridge um, when this rolls out? And it's, you know, days, but I don't know exactly how many, but small number. And so bridges, um, the, yeah. So the main difference is this, you know, everybody likes to make a lot of like uh, kind of, complex um they want to create or paint a complex picture of why their bridge is so great and how it works you know and bridges as actually vitalik has pointed out they kind of boil down to in most cases bridges are just multi-sigs they're just a group of people who say oh yeah this money can go over there you know and like selecting that group of people is usually what bridge technologies are about and um now there are you know if you look at like the atomic swap type bridging um you know it's it's arguably um different than what i'm describing can be but uh it's also not really the same kind of thing and it's not really accepted as the same kind of thing and so when you look at bridging that would enable you to send um one currency to another system and leave it there or move it around or use it there those technologies uh the ones that i am aware of and have seen are generally um boiled down to some form of a multi-sig of people who agreed that that was uh, okay to do. So Varus actually works a little bit differently. It works differently. And it, and it in fact is kind of predicated on the idea that to prove a transaction cross chain on another chain that came from you know, another chain, you should be able to have cryptographic proof of that transaction its inputs and what it's doing that is as close to as good as possible if not as good 
as the cryptographic proof that we use on a local blockchain to prove inputs and outputs of UTXO transactions. And that's really what we worked to create. So there is, you know, notaries are witnesses to the existing rules being followed on the blockchain. And after miners and stakers have been following those rules, are agreeing that, you know, this is in fact the correct um, chain based on the rules. That's it. That's what they do. Notaries do that. They don't sign transactions that are, um, you know, money that then gets sent over to another uh, chain as approved by this group. That isn't how it works. That's how it works on other bridges that I'm aware of in the general case. Our bridge is different in the sense that what we do is there is a process. Now, right now, we include notaries for finalization of that. There is a process to just determine the agreed upon state of the blockchain. That's just a thing. And when we had, like two years ago, when we had a test net that actually was doing auto notarization, it used a process with an algorithm that we we can still use, but we um, we want to get through all, I think I mentioned this before, all of the cryptographic proofs of the auto notarization, just to say, okay, that's, that's just as correct before we can actually get rid of notaries. And there are some questions around Sybil attacks and things like that for for just agreeing on the state. Okay, final state, finalization. And so um, once we know that that is the state of the blockchain, that's the state of the Varus chain, that's the state of the Ethereum chain, or that's the state of the Varus chain and that's the state of a PBAS chain, or any other chain that we're bridging to, that is all we need to know. Every other part, of the bridge, sending currency, sending identities, sending currency definitions to make the currencies interoperable across systems and allow the flow of different currencies that you didn't anticipate at the beginning. All of these things which are in the release on testnet, they're proven cryptographically based on just the fact that that is the chain state. And no group of anyone, no group of notaries, no group of signers or privileged, you know, DAO members sign the transaction that sends currency from one chain to another. It's proven cryptographically using the state, the known state of the other chain that would not be accepted cross chain if it wasn't correct. It's proven cryptographically that those transactions, the person who sent those transactions on the other chain, the miners who rolled them up, the miner who imported them, that on all sides, people are just following the protocol. And for every output, even if it goes through a DeFi conversion, there is a corresponding input. There is a corresponding um, conversion or not. For every fee output in the native currency, there is a corresponding source. And so the difference is really that our bridge is a cryptographic bridge. And the process of determining the root of the other chain can work in a, new, in a number of different ways. Um, we have what we call auto notarization that happens with mining and staking. And then is witnessed by notaries, and that those notaries they don't do they don't process money uh, transactions. They simply are witnesses, like real notaries in real life. They just say, "Yep, I agree." And then another one in another part of the world says, "Yep, I agree." And they don't use like with Solana. Oh, they're using the Whisper protocol. Who cares? Like really, like who cares? The Whisper, pro- whatever protocol you use between people who are trying to agree on something. If it isn't on the blockchain, it's just another layer of complexity, but okay, you can do it. It, If it's a network that allows them to communicate, then great, it's a network that allows them to communicate. But all of the descriptions of these different bridges are, it's just like, 
li- what we call lipstick on the pig, you know, um, or what I've been in groups that call that, you know, it's like, the fact is that most bridges are just a multi-sig of people saying this money can go over there and be minted as these currencies over there. And we don't do that at all. Uh, I should, there is in a centralized currency, that's what we call a centralized currency. You could do that actually, I'm sorry. We, we do that all day long on centralized currencies. Those are what we call centralized currencies. You know, a DAO can create a centralized currency. Anyone, in fact, it, okay, that's the same as what people are doing, except that the difference is that um, it's a lot more straightforward. You don't have to use a whisper protocol and do all sorts of, you know, fancy wormhole tricks to make it work with EVM and everything else, because all of those things just create more risk of errors. And when you're working on a platform with an unlimited number of EVM contracts, the platform itself is not auditable. It's impossible. It's just theoretically impossible to audit because any audit you start today is going to be, you know, you're going to have a hundred more different fundamental money manipulating contracts on that protocol, you know, in the next day. So you cannot audit the protocol. And when you audit one EVM contract, it's like, what did you do? It's like a tiny little drop in the sea of all of the random programmer errors that everybody makes and they're you know adding how many contracts every day to the platform that are manipulating that are manipulating money and so what we're trying to do is take out the you know actual complex nature we're not hiding behind all these different oh it does this protocol or that protocol and by name it's just pretty simple you know you get the root of each chain that gives you a provable like with a merkle mountain range or on Ethereum, it's Patricia Trees. On Pomodo, if they did the bridge, it would be, you know, the Merkel of Merkels. You know, on Bitcoin, it would be like a Merkel of Merkels. Or we would just, we could just do a Merkel mountain range for Bitcoin quite easily. You know, the bottom line is that you just get a root of each chain. You know what kind of protocol you're dealing with and what you have to prove in order to know that there were sources of that input and that they match in the protocol. And then you just prove them and then you break it. So it's now, now it's two separate issues. One is how do you get the root of a chain? And that's where we do the, you know, the mining and the staking and everyone's involved in being incentivized with that protocol. And then you have notaries just witnessing, yep, that's correct. And they got a little, little part of it just for running because that's their motivation. They're running, they're watching the chain and they say, yep, that's the right, that's the right one. They all say it worldwide you know and they do it on the blockchain and everybody can watch it and if anyone wanted to say oh i'm going to write a monitoring program to make sure that you know the various um protocol is working exactly as it should that's actually quite easy to do and you know anyone who wanted to just say oh i'm not going to trust it if the protocol is not working as it should exactly they could just verify that it was because everything is public protocol provable cross chain provable same chain provable and the defi protocol and the pbas cross chain protocol the ethereum cross chain with various protocol they're really all the same protocol and because of the you know cross chain with ethereum on the ethereum side yes as all bits pointed out we need to use an ethereum contract because that's the only way they know how to do it so that they don't have any knowledge at the lower level of protocols that could keep things more secure. They just have this wild west at the EVM level. So, okay. But in our contracts on the Ethereum side, they don't do much. They really don't do much. They don't try to do DeFi and all of the things that, you know, they don't try to be super fancy with, we you know, Bifrost bridges or, or wormhole whisper tricks or any of this stuff. They simply just take same reserve transfers in that we support on all of our uh, PBAS chains in Varus, and they send that. They validate that it's a regular trans like transaction, and they make sure that the source funds are there. And then they send that transaction over to Varus, or actually Varus uh, pulls the transactions from them, um, and anyone can do that. 
Because all Varus needs to know is the root, the Ethereum blockchain, and everything else is just provable. And there's no, you know, Varus doesn't take a multi-sig. If Varus, if Varus used the multi-sig model, the way that that would work is just, it would be a centralized currency run by the ID that is that currency, which can have, you know, 13 of 25 as signers. So it's a DAO. So, you know, somebody could do that too, but you as a user on the Varus platform, whether you're on the PBAS chain or the Varus chain, you know that that currency is a centralized currency and that, you know, you, you're going to need to trust, whether it's, you know, like a WBTC type currency or something, you're going to need to trust the group of people behind it to be doing everything correctly. And that's kind of where bridges are today, cross-chain bridges, but they don't really just come out and say it for many reasons, I suppose. Anyways, that's that's just a, an overview of why we're different. And I'll say one more thing about PBAS because there we had a lot more people on than we had last time and it wasn't recorded last time. And uh, that is that when you're running on uh, PBAS chains on the new testnet that's about, you know, that's going to be released in days, um, you can move the definition of one currency cross chains so that that currency can now be sent through the bridges to other chains. And so you could, for example, and this is, you know, when we get to mainnet, this is how it will work. You could, for example, define or launch a currency on a PBAS chain, not even on Varus. Send the definition to Varus, use that in Varus um, actional liquidity baskets, send that definition over to Ethereum. Well, the, the Ethereum bridge won't be able to do this in this first release, but by the time we get to main net, that is one of the priorities of getting that into the Ethereum bridge. Send it to Ethereum as an, as an ERC-20 automatic, like, automatically created ERC-20 definition. And then you can send all those currencies back and forth. So you're basically like punching holes through the bridges, but they're completely provable. They follow all the protocol and everything is provable. And the reason that we're going to be able to, not going to, well, we're doing it now on the testing. You'll be able to do it in the next few days on testnet. You'll basically be able to say, okay, I can take the Ethereum currencies that we will have through the Ethereum bridge. And I can send those to any PBAS chain and I can use them on those PBAS chains and I can send them back to Varus and I can create currencies on one PBAS chain that I, that I move the definition of that currency to Varus and to another PBAS chain. And so any currency definition, any ID definition created anywhere on the Varus network or the network of Varus compatible blockchains, PIP protocol compatible blockchain, will be able to be used on any other part of the network through this protocol. And we can start doing that in days on testnet. And I don't know of a bridge that does that, for example. But the reason that we're able to do that, and I don't even know how other, I don't even know how other uh, platforms will be able to do this without Eris IDs. They're not gonna be able to do it with what I've seen so far because the way that it works is because we have the Varus ID hierarchical namespace that allows that's also bound to currencies and bound to blockchains, which was all part of the plan. Because we're able to do this, if I have Golem.eth, I get that from you know Ethereum to Varus. That same Golem.eth, that name Golem.eth is going to be the same currency on every blockchain in the network using that currency and every part of the fractal unlimited chain protocol you know protocol network will be able to know when it receives that currency is it coming where is it coming from or did it like what chains did it go through to get there you know and and so um the interoperability is not just one system interoperating with another on the hard-coded currencies we decided to allow it to interoperate with it's really a truly interoperable you know limited chain and system interoperable blockchain network and it's not based on the kind of bridging that vitalik assumed when he said bridging isn't 
going to be good because he was assuming the wrong kind of bridging in his world. Yeah. With EVM and, and the models they've got to work with and, and that they have to cram their ideas into. Yeah. You know, they're not, they're, they're having lots of troubles and, and, you know, it's easy to say these words when we're not on mainnet yet, but um, so far I haven't seen any of, any of the problems that I've seen on these different bridges, they're not problems that our model is susceptible to. So that's, you know, another reason why we're just making sure that we get this right. We release it and it's a new model. It's provable bridging. All you need is to know that you understand the state of the other chain. It's provable bridging. and. You know, we, I don't, we took a different approach than everyone else. And uh, the IDs fit right into that to make it something that right out on testnet, it just works. It's, it's really, it's really beautiful. And I don't, you know, I kind of wish that I had time to jump into that conversation about the Solana bridge hack and all this stuff, because but I think it's, I still believe it's more valuable for us to just get this stuff done. And for people like all bits who understand, you know, how to, um, how to help others understand. And maybe some people now on this uh, discussion or who, who read what all bits had to say, or, you know, would know more about how to talk about it. I'm happy to answer questions if it would help people know how to talk about it. And when we finish this stuff and it's on mainnet, I will be in those conversations. I'm not going to be so quiet. But right now, you know, my energy is focused on getting these things done along with other people who have their energy focused on that and just finishing them and getting them released. And it, it's, it's going well right now. It's going well. Um, and, you know, the new, I, I really hope that people will take advantage of the new test net and, and we're going to do more on it because of what it's capable of doing. So anyways, I'll stop. And if people have questions fine but then uh, I, I interrupted you so maybe just let people see if there are any questions and then continue and already take over i know i talk a lot when i talk uh, don't worry mike everybody uh, enjoys listening so uh i did see a uh question from uh was it bishop how are the initial uh notaries chosen and what resources uh, do they require we're we're going to Choose notaries in the community for the ETH bridge. It's going to include people working on it and people who have been contributing along the way and people who really have the basically what you'll need to be able to do. And, and, and you're, it's not going to be a vote the first time at first. It's just because right now the, the first step is going to be to get the ETH working and we do i don't want to delay this with having discussions about oh it's the protocol is decentralized the only thing and everybody can monitor everything and the only thing that we're going to be doing is you know making sure that each chain is the route that it says it is that's it that's the only the the miners and stakers are going to make about 25x more on just the um notarization process and notaries and notaries are not necessarily actually going to make money because it only depends on how much is used on the bridge. But the um, the only thing that notaries are going to need to do, they will need to be able to respond if there are events on the network. So they can't just be, you know, people who aren't accessible or who aren't willing to just help when something happens immediately. We can't have notaries that behave like that. Um, we're going to need to have, uh, basically, the notaries are going to have to care about the network. And they're going to need to run, uh, a, it doesn't have, even have to be public nodes. In fact, we're kind of expecting that the notaries aren't going to run public nodes for their notarization because um, all the notaries, their only job is to watch the network, just like any user would watch the network. And they get... They are prevented from witnessing the network until a certain number of blocks passed where the miners and stakers said this is correct and put in a proposed notarization. The notaries are not allowed 
to sign and notarize until after the miners and stakers have actually put that in. So if the miners and stakers don't notarize, that means anyone can do it. If the miners and stakers don't notarize, then notarization won't happen. So the miners and stakers are going to be putting the notarizations into their blocks. There are rules that are built into the demon and you know on how that works. Pools will be able to do it. Miners and stakers will be able to do it. Um, and and the way that that works is um, once they do it, they they will be subject to a reward if that um, notarization is used to prove the root of the chain. They'll be subject to a reward that's based on um, the commerce of what that was used to prove. Um, that's good. And and then the uh, notaries will wait, right? I think right now on testnet, it's like 15 blocks minimum. And that typically includes a confirmation by another uh, notary, or I mean, it's by, by another um, miner or staker, which also confirm. And then the notaries can start to agree by posting their signature on the blockchain. I agree, I agree, I agree. And when there are enough notary signatures on the blockchain saying they agree, anyone, which is usually a notary, can wrap that up, send it to the other side, and the other side can validate that, yep, it's the correct um, chain on, like you've got the correct state on my side, because that's cryptographically provable or not. It won't be accepted if it's not. And uh, all of the notaries that need to have agreed and it's cryptographically provable on the other side. And once that's done, now we have a new uh, confirmed notarization on both sides. And so the, the notary really only needs to run a native node. Um, we think about it. Conceivably, a notary, somebody could make a light node um, notary wallet because basically, you know, probably better for the worldwide network if nobody really knows exactly what IP and port address notary node is running from so that it can't be targeted for any reason. Um, so it's that much more unstoppable and censorship resistant. And the uh, notaries really should just be connected to the network in the same way as everybody else so that they're witnessing everything the same as everybody else. So, And then, and then after we get through, I don't know, the first like 10 months, you know, or six months or a year, we, we could do voting. Um, and this kind of thing but i think more likely we're really going to work to just eliminate the, the need for notaries so that's the goal is to just the, the reason that notaries are important right now it's not because we can't cryptographically prove that one side or the other um is a valid chain it's that one thing that's incredibly hard to prove is that the network was accessible and visible to everybody. That's really, the, that's really the only thing that is really hard to prove. And so what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to have notaries that are around the world using you know, regular nodes. They're basically just saying, I see this, you know, because that is a way, as long as those notaries are simply running their nodes and doing that job, that is a way to be sure that that the you know the internet wasn't split because when we're designing protocols that have to work on a worldwide network we do have to take into consideration the possibility that there could be a literal split in the internet between some set of countries because at some point there will be and in the past there has been and you know if you have a model where you've got Effectively, notari notaries um, worldwide. By the way, uh, I'm really sorry about this. I'm actually going to have to drop off. I see that I've got a call that I'm going to um, that I need to take, and I'm going to have to uh, put this discussion on hold on my end. 
so that I can take this call 